Faith has always been the only way to please God. Think about that for just a second. Faith has always been the only way to please God. When you think of the Old Testament, do you picture that? Or is it a, uh, a series of do's and don'ts and regulations to follow? It's really been the only way to, to be reconciled to God, to be uh, transformed by the effects of God. It's the only way to enter in a right relationship with him. It's where righteousness is credited to the person. Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 25, talks about Abraham, who we're talking about. The faith of Abraham. <coughs> we recently looked at several heroes of Judaism's faith. We looked at Abel, Enoch, Noah, and they believed God's message. They obeyed his wishes. They trusted God that he was going to fulfill the promise that he had given to them. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, that's all. Well, let's look now. We're going to pick up another uh, character, this character of Abraham. We're in Hebrews chapter 11. And verses 8 through 12. By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city and foundations whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and count, as countless as the sand on the seashore. Uh, you also may want to, in your reading uh, sometime this week, to read uh, Genesis chapter 12, and that gives the story, the account of God calling Abraham and telling him to go uh, to this place uh, that he would inherit. And in case I forget to mention it, he never actually... Inherits, inherits it like we think of inheritance, where we accumulate all this property and all this land. Uh, you fathers, you're going to leave a bunch of property and land to your kids? Just to tease them out, right? But that's the idea of inheritance. We think we're going to accumulate all this stuff that our parents uh, accumulated, and they pass it down to us. But he never really gets the land of Canaan. It's his inheritance, and it's his descendants are going to claim that land. But interestingly, he never does. So I just wanted to mention that for it. <coughs> now, chronologically, we're past the flood of Noah. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And we've come to this, this next character named Abraham, and that's where the writer in chapter 11 says, By faith, Abraham. Now, he lived a long time ago. It, that's approximate dates uh, could be, you know, about 2100 B.C., somewhere in there. Uh, in his day, the, a new era of human history began. Before this, God had maintained sort of a, a very general, uh, you know, Genesis goes in big chunks. We read it, and we think, oh, this happened just next and this next and this next. But it really could be great junk, uh, chunks of time in between events or people. And But at this time, God is dealing with mankind just in a very general sense. He's not interacting with 
them in what we would think of normally. And it's all because of a significant event that occurred, this building of a tower at a place called Babel. Uh, we might think of Babylon, I'm going to show you a map in just a second so you can find Babylon on there. And that's probably approximately where this tower was built. And out of humans' pride and arrogance and belief that they could reach the heavens on their own uh, abilities and skills, they built this, this tower, they built this structure. And that general relationship that they had with God was permanently shattered. And he's even going to be in their lives even less than what he was prior to that. Mankind was scattered and splattered all over the face of the earth and their languages were changed so they couldn't communicate with each other. We have some in here that English is not their first language so we can talk about different languages. And if she spoke in Spanish, there's no way I could follow her and what, what she's talking about. Uh, but she could use her hands or she could uh, do the Spanglish thing and enter English Spanish combo of words and I could finally catch on a little bit. But this, this happened where God says, I'm changing their languages. They're not gonna be able to communicate with one another. I'm gonna scatter them all over the face of the earth and all over that area at least and mix them up and let's see how arrogance and pride can work now. And the price of revolting against God was that no communication and spread out over the earth. Now me as an introvert, I, I would actually love this uh, particular part. Uh, no communication and being away from people and things like that. It might not be bad for me. I guess probably after a while, I'd probably at least want to go to the grocery store and see somebody. Um, but God has abandoned them. And now people have no genuine connection to God. They have languages in which there's no revelation. They have uh, no written revelations. There are no traditional revelations passed down because they're not communicating with one another. Man is alienated and given over to his idolatry. And when he uh, knew God, he glorified him not, Romans chapter 1 says. God abandoned them to immorality, to homosexuality, to reprobate minds. Merciful, mercifully, though, God had a plan. And God is going to decide to reveal himself, not in the broad sense, but in a very specific sense through one man, this man named Abraham. And he became the father of the people of Israel, the nation that became the repository of divine revelation, where they would pass it down orally, they would pass it down in writing, and they would deliver that to their descendants and their descendants and their descendants. They would communicate it to them in Hebrew, Aramaic, and then Greek. So God sent his word to his people Israel, the children of Abraham. They're going to hear his word, they're going to inscribe his word, and they're going to proclaim it to the nations of the world, the words of the living God. They were the messengers that uh, would proclaim salvation was available, that sinners could be reconciled to God through faith, just like Abraham. And as he became the central figure and model of their faith, he's also for us because he's written uh, to New Testament Christians to follow the faith of Abraham. We are children of Abraham if we live by faith. And this is critically important if salvation is going to be obtained uh, through faith. Let me go over to Romans chapter uh, 4 and read a few verses there. And you're welcome to turn along if you have a Bible with you. In Romans chapter 4, uh, 1 through 3. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, uh, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then if you'll skip down to verses 22, uh, 
uh, to the end of the passage. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to our life for justification. So Abraham's life uh, became the pattern to follow for all of us, for the Israelites and all who would come by faith. It's completely a life of faith. And Stephen is going to reiterate that. Remember Stephen in Acts chapter 7, who he's going to be put on kind of a vigilante trial. And in his defense, he's going to preach a sermon uh, that he's going to talk about. By the way, Acts chapter 7, knock that in your mind. Anytime anybody says, you know, they got 15 minutes, tell me about the Bible. Acts chapter 7, just read it to them. 1 through 15, whatever verses it is. Because Stephen does a, a wonderful job of just going through, hitting the highlights, the key points that lead to Jesus. So if we go back there, and there, we look at in the book of Acts there, Acts chapter, did I say Acts chapter 7? That's what I meant to say anyway. Uh, so you're going to notice that Stephen's going to be put to death. He's going to be stoned to death. But he talks about uh, this message leading to Christ. And he begins at a very strategic point in verses uh, 2 through 5. Well, the high priest said, asked him in verse 1, are these charges true that they've charged him with, right? This crazy talk that he's been thinking or doing. And he said, to this he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Iran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. Uh, so he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land. Even though at that time, Abraham had no child. So there's all kinds of stuff happening there. He's going to get this land and his descendants are going to inherit this land. He's 75 years old when he leaves Haran. And he's close to 100 by the time Isaac is born. Uh, so he's, he's an older man, right? And he's done all this traveling. He's walked. He's probably in good shape. You know, Larry's uh, 79. He can run circles around me. Of course, I'm old. I'm decrepit and everything. But uh, just he's, he must have been in good shape walking. <laughs> from Ur to Haran, accumulating stuff, and then moving down to Canaan. And so Stephen preached this message about salvation, and he begins where we should always begin, with Abraham's example of faith. Salvation by faith seems to go against the basic thought of Judaism, that people were, uh, had to earn their way, had to keep this law, to keep this rule. Oh, what did the rich rulers, rich guy say to Jesus, I've kept all those things from my youth. I've done it. Look at me. Jesus said, sell all your possessions and give them to the poor. Man will be sad because he thought he could earn salvation through his works and through his deeds. But salvation has always come through faith. The Israelites thought Abraham had a relationship with God. He was chosen by him. And that Abraham was blessed because he was better than everybody else. He had done all these things, kept those rules, kept those regulations. He was the best of all the pagans, which is what Abraham was. The Bible does not teach justification by works, by keeping the law. All have sinned, Romans 3.23 says. And to destroy this faulty idea, the Holy Spirit tells uh, Abraham and also Stephen as he re reiterated this that Abraham was a man who lived by, with God by faith. He was justified by faith. And that of course is a very dramatic change from what the Jews believed. 
Many of them actually even wanted to ride Abraham's coattails. In John chapter 8, verses 29 through 42, where uh, Jesus said, uh, you know, we can turn stones into children for Abraham, of Abraham. And you're not Abraham's children because you're, you don't do what I said, what God asked you to do. You're not doing it. Oh, but Abraham is our father, and, and they tried to rely on him. Well, Galatians 3, 7 says, Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. It's those who live by faith. They're sons of Abraham. Genesis 15, verse 6 says that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. It was in the credit side of the, the ledger. Not the debit side, but the credit side. That's like a savings account versus what you spent and now you're in the hole. Now you have a savings account, right? And his faith is what credited to righteousness. It wasn't the things he did, although those, those were incorporated in his act of faith, but his trust that God was going to lead him to a place that he would inherit that was going to be great and awesome and powerful, right? And so he believed God, and it was given him a credit of righteousness. And we can be sure that those who live by faith are sons of Abraham, Romans 1, verse 17 says. A true believer's spiritual life is established in faith. And so that's what the writer of Hebrews is using Abraham here as a, a model of faith. And he models it for us. Today we're going to consider his calling from Ur of the Chaldeans. In a couple weeks, um, I swapped with Doug, so I'm going to be talking about Abraham and his son Isaac, which we kind of lean into at the end of this lesson. But we're going to look at the example of faith uh, on Mount Moriah with his son Isaac. So let's first look, as we go through here in Hebrews, we're going to look at three Ps. We're going to look at the pilgrimage of faith and the, uh, sorry, I forgot what it was, the other P. I don't know why I made Ps, but I did. I know the last one's power. Uh, the patience and then the power of faith. Sorry about that. So let's talk about the pil this pilgrimage of faith. Hebrews 11, 8 says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go to a place he would later receive as in his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. There's something really interesting about uh, the way this was written. Uh, it's in a, this, this phrase, when called to go, it is written in a present participle. So if you guys are English majors, you would, can relate to that. But if not, let me help you out. If it's written in a present participle, it speaks of the response going on at the same time as the calling. So when God called, Abraham was already in motion to respond. That's where his heart was, his mind was. God called him, and he's already moving in that direction. Interesting to think about uh, when God calls us to do something. Are we? Does it take us a while to get off the couch, off the a chair off the patio deck to do whatever it is God is calling us. And so how strong is Abraham's faith? He didn't uh, just say, yeah, okay, I'll be on that. Uh, wait, I got a few chores to end, do and let me, let me take care of this and that and then I'll go. No, he left everything familiar, everything he knew, not knowing, not contemplating, not giving his attention to these things, but rather speedy obedience. <coughs> I sound like Mr. Rogers, I know, a speedy delivery guy, but speedy obedience, and perhaps when you think about your life, perhaps God is calling you to do something. God is calling you to do something. Are things coincidental or are they purposeful? Let's take a side step for just a moment. And I want to talk about the geography uh, side of things. Ur of the Chaldeans. So Ur is way over that way, 
right at the bottom. You can see that. <coughs> and this is known as the Fertile Crescent, which most historians believe is where mankind originated. Thus, it's probably the Garden of Eden somewhere in that area. And life went out from that particular point. But we're beyond that with Abraham's day, right? We're thousands of years maybe beyond uh, that kind of thing. So he's from Ur, and some Bible historians say that this is a city. Some speak of it as a general regional thing, and I'll get to that in just a second. But Ur Kastim is mentioned four times in the Hebrew Bible. It's mentioned three in Genesis 11, 28, 31, and 15, verse 7. And then also Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 7. And it's very distinctive, and it usually is rendered in English as of the Chaldees, or the Chaldeans, depending on which translation you use. The Septuagint, or the Greek translation of Genesis, did not include the word Ur. Instead, it describes the land of the Chaldeans. And this is also, if you remember what we just read about with Stephen, that's what he said. He said it was the land of the Chaldeans. So Chaldea is that southern part of that fertile crescent at the bottom, depending on which way you look at the bottom uh, right or left. Uh, it's, it would have included the upper edge of the Persian Gulf, and you can't see it, but that white space over there, if you can picture the Persian Gulf, a uh, member of the Persian Gulf War back with the first George Bush, when all that was going on there. So um, that was an, it's an important waterway, important trading route, is going to be not too far from where Ur is down there. And so you're going to have a, a civilization of prosperity, uh, ample water, land for pasturing. It would have been active with commerce, with trade on the ships, but also from the Tigris and the Euphrates River that are going to go down into the Persian Gulf. So a lot of waterway, a lot of tr uh, trade and transport, those kinds of things. So a very productive, very civilized uh, location, at least in that day, right? Civilized, we look at that. Comfortable living. It's sort of like uh, us, right? Everything's kind of comfortable. We have things that we have, we open up the tap and the water comes. It's a little bit more fancy and a little bit more uh, new than his day. You had to carry in buckets your water, but uh, the idea is he had everything he needed, very comfortable. And sometimes we get really comfortable with where we're at. I know some of you are antsy to, to move to a new location, not mentioning any names, but and it's close by, so don't get panicked here. But um, <coughs> we're getting very comfortable with where we're at. And Abraham likely would have had a really hard time imagining any better place than Ur of the Chaldeans. But he believed the promises of God, and God credited that faith to him as righteousness. Archaeologists have shown us that the people of ancient Mesopotamia, this region of the Chaldeans, they would have had uh, all this going for the very comfortable life, but also, interestingly, they worshipped many gods. And... Uh, in some in regions that still takes place, but most mostly now it's Islam, but uh, that does have taken place. And so they, they believed in many gods. They worshiped, they were many gods. They worshiped uh, those that were called polytheists. And their chief god was named Nana. I know Lucy Nelly called uh, Gina Nanny, so don't get confused. She's not the, the moon god uh, or goddess like Nana is here, but she's close, but she's not really a moon god. So the people of Ur lived in a couple different areas. One was the very general area where they were a very common district where there would be libraries and, and uh, marketplaces, things like that, to do commerce, to do business. And then some people also lived uh, in a very sacred, religious, strategic place that would be protected by strong walls and it had a dedicated temple or a ziggurat. Some of you are taking uh, 
seventh grade history, you'll probably know that. Um, and so they were protected by these strong walls. The ziggurat was located as sort of like a, a pyramid looking thing, but it's not close to that, but that's, that's sort of what it's like. And they had other great temples to other gods, not just Nana. But people brought their gifts, their offerings to Nana. So let's get back to Abraham now. So we talked about kind of where he's from. His father and his parents have lived there probably their entire lives. They've grown up, they've, Terah has raised his family there, steeped in the religious atmosphere, the wealth, the commerce, the rivers, the lushness, and Abraham is called. And remember, his heart is already moving when the calling comes. It's not because Abraham saw a brochure of Canaan and said, ooh, wouldn't you like to come over here? I mean, if he looked west, all he would see is sand and desert and some barren hills. It's not that he had an eight by 10 colored glossy of the promised land to stick on his refrigerator and dream about uh, retiring someday in this beautiful Canaan. He had to receive postcards from the Mediterranean shore saying, wish you were here. It wasn't because he promised, was promised a grand estate to possess, but this was his pilgrimage of faith. And this was the separation from his old life to new. And so think about this with you, your old life to new. Let me tell you some more about Abraham. He was a pagan, a pagan. A pagan is someone who uh, will worship many different ideas, many different gods, uh, will take them or leave them, uh, don't really believe that they're all that official anyway, uh, working for things, lusting after things and after possessions, stuff like that. He was among the people who had been scattered because of the Tower of Babel. He was not some secret believer that every day in his, in his room he would worship the true and living God. We don't have any evidence of that. And he was just a pagan, just like a lot of the other pagans that lived in Ur of the Chaldeans. And we might add he wasn't any better than anybody else. And the scripture never said he was any better. <coughs> but here's what God says. He says, listen to me, Isaiah 51, 1 and 2. You who pursue <clears throat> righteousness. You want to pursue righteousness, he says, then seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to Abraham, your father, and Sarah, who gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. The statement that Isaiah is making here is that if you want to understand salvation, you look back and you realize that you were dug out of a rock, that you were uh, quarried out of this uh, pit and established by God. You were quarried out of that rock of paganism probably as well. More explicitly, Joshua 42, uh, 40, back up, Joshua 24, verse 2, says that Terah, the father of Abraham, worshipped other gods. So here's the family that Abraham is built up in. All these gods being worshipped. You might have one of, carved out of stone, one carved out of wood, one that looks like whatever, right? All these gods that they would follow, they would worship idolatry. He belonged to a pagan culture. He was a polytheistic sinner. He lived in a pagan region. And he lived in Ur until he was 70 years old. Pretty established in paganism, I would, I would think. Pretty established. And this was Abraham's upbringing and his life. But God appeared to him. And again, this is an analogy of, of uh, the work of salvation. When God appears to the sinner and quarries him and quarries you and hewn you out of a rock, right? And here's how it happened. Stephen in Acts chapter 7. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people 
God said, and go to the land I will show you. What marvelous grace for God to reach into a pagan's life and call him forth. But what marvelous faith Abraham exhibited when he was already heading that direction. That's amazing. Well, here's a thought question for you, and I'll give you these scriptures, and I know you're not going to be able to write it down quick enough, and that's okay. I can send them to you. Uh, but think about this. How does the concept of the way God called Abraham, how does that affect your interpretation of your own calling? There's lots of verses that talk about you were called, you were chosen, uh, you were elected, those kinds of things, depending on which translation you use. Romans 8, 28, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, 1 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12, 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9, Hebrews 9, 11 through 15, 1 Peter 2, 9, and 2 Peter 1, 5 through 10. All talk about your calling. You make your calling and election sure. Those kinds of passages, right? What does the word church mean? Ecclesia. It means the called out. We're called out of that old life and into a new life. Called out of Ur's in a spiritual way and called to a new life, a new inheritance, a new direction. How is your calling like Abraham's? How is it different? You might think about those kinds of things. And so the glory of God stooped down to a pagan in the midst of thousands of other pagans living in that same area and a man who is sunken in sin, a man in the pit of iniquity and now he's hewn out of that rock and called forth with a command, with a test whether he's going to believe one of the gods that he worships and him only and him only is he going to respond and separate himself yep he left in fact, in the act of obeying, God was still in the act of calling. And that's the beginning of Abraham's pilgrimage. Of you see, he left, he left the land of his birth. He forsook his home. And you might think of where you were born. Uh, I don't think anybody was born in Roseville here, except maybe some kids. But all of us adults... We're born some other place. So he left behind the land of his birth, not because it was a bad place to leave. Tigers, Euphrates, palm trees, water, commerce, cash, possessions, servants. He forsook his home, he forsook his estate, he severed his family ties, and he left loved ones behind. He abandoned comfortable things, familiar things, to embrace total uncertainty. Go where? Canaan? Where is that? He'd never been across that desert, I'm guessing. He'd never been to the Mediterranean Sea. He lived in Ur, the land of the Chaldeans. He abandoned all those things. He broke with idolatrous things break with the world, a break with the familiar, a break from sin. Same thing Jesus says in Luke chapter 14, 26. Leave father and mother. Follow me. Galatians 2, Paul says in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. He loved me gave himself for me. A life of faith demands a break with everything that is familiar, a willingness to separate from your past life. And this is where every Christian's pilgrimage begins. And when you separate from the world, you might want to look at 1 Thessalonians 1, 9. That's, that's where our big break comes. You ever dreamed of having a big break? Maybe a tap dancer or a singer? I know Aubrey's probably imagined herself on American Idol or one of those other singing shows. 
she should go on. She, I think she should go on. Uh, but we're, we're looking for the big break in the showbiz, or the big break into something, the big break into my business or whatever. But I'm talking about a big break and leaving that behind. That's what Abraham did. That's where he was. We haven't received our inheritance either, but we wait patiently for it. It's going to come. And that was Abraham. That's, in a sense, his figure, or he's a figure for us to follow, to model ourselves after. And we can see that this man of faith separates himself from the world to go to an inheritance which he has promised but which he's never going to actually inherit. He's not going to own the land. He's just going to be there as a nomad. Some future point, some unknown point, his descendants will inherit the land. But he had set his mind on the heavenly. Colossians 3, 1 talks about that as well. Set your mind on things above. And by the way, this journey of Abraham it took a long time. He spent five years in a town called Haran, which is way up there at the top, before he comes to Canaan. His faith never wavered. His pilgrimage of faith began. Well, let's look now at the patience of faith. Let me take another side step. So, Ur to Canaan, you think a direct shot. I mean, when I'm driving, Marshall wants to take all the side jumps. Ooh, let's follow the river for a while because she wants to look at that. But I say, let's get there. Let's go there. And that would have been a miserable journey. But Abraham and his father Terah and his nephew, Abraham's nephew Lot, uh, and Sarah, and all their servants, all their livestock, they trek. Where are you going to take livestock across the desert? It's not going to work. And so they trek north to both the Euphrates. And I'm not exactly sure why. The Bible never tells us. But the trade route would have still followed this river. But they go to Haran for some reason. I don't know if they're tired of the travel and they know a city up there. Some uh, more recent historians believe that Ur is actually located out of the picture up there. And so it would have been a straighter shot. But to me, it still seems like Haran would be a nice place to stop and rest. And rest they did. They, they stayed there for five years. Stayed there for five years. The patience of Abraham. Hebrews chapter 9, or 11 verses 9 and 10, where we've already read. Abraham comes to Haran, and he's going to come down into Canaan eventually. And he's going to become an alien. Not an alien like E.T., but an alien because he... He's a foreigner, and he doesn't have a right, uh, at least in the minds of the people, to this land. God gives it, is going to give it to him as inheritance, but the people that are living there say, this is our land. And so he becomes an alien, a stranger in a strange land. He's a nomad. He's gathered up everything he owns, including servants, and while in Haran, he accumulates you know, five years worth of more livestock and more servants and more stuff, more in the caravan to go south to Canaan. And he came to the land of promise, but he's a tent dweller. He lives in a tent along with Isaac and Jacob who followed him. We went to the baseball game last night and, and Carter was driving. For some reason I let Carter drive, I'm not sure why. But, uh, he decided he wanted to go through Sacramento down, I mean, downtown Sacramento to go to the, the stadium. And I didn't want to get there as quickly as possible. I would have taken the freeway and gotten off and go to the stadium. But he said, let's go downtown. And there's a tent city down there at about uh, 
just before K Street, so it's a couple north, so L Street, maybe somewhere in there. And I said, that's that's not a bunch of homeless people. Those people are camping. They're they're just living. I mean, they had a porta potty. They had campground. I'm sure the kids played games together. It's just like camping, right? And that's that's the way Abraham would have been viewed coming into town, into the big <coughs> region of Canaan, and living in a tent. And can you imagine the size of the tent? Down there at the Sunrise Mall a week or so ago, they had some kind of circus thing happening because there was a huge tent in the parking lot. I don't know if you saw that or not, but I go that way every morning at work. Huge tent. Is that a was like Abraham's, I'm not sure, but he lived in tents and he had lots and lots of people with him, servants, livestock, cattle, sheep, entourage. And he comes to this land. He's a tent dweller, just like Isaac and Jacob are going to be that follow him. To whom the same, same covenant is given to them, by the way. Reiterate, your descendants will inherit the land. He's a foreigner living alongside Canaanites. It was promised to him, but he never really possessed it. You can read more about that in Genesis chapter 23. Well, it wasn't very long until the nation was hauled off, remember, to Egypt. And the people of Abraham's loins were there for more, about 400 years. So he is separated from his old life. He's in a land where he really doesn't possess it, but yet God says you're going to possess it. He's a stranger in this world. He's living in a tent. He's a nomad. And I think this is also an analogy for us because right now we just live in this tent. We're nomads in this land. We, we're just passing through. We're pilgrims living alongside the people of the world without ever taking possession of what is promised to us. And so Abraham, he has God's promise. He's never seen by him in his life. He's never seen it. He never owns it. He wanders through Israel, a tent dweller. He abandoned his, his old life for a future promise. I think the hardest is in the in-between part because the getting up and going, if he began in Ur down here, by the time they got to Babylon, he might have just said, that's close enough. You see, it's the time in between, the, the time where we become a Christian, we, we put our faith in God, and we trust him, and we're excited, and then the lull happens, or stuff happens, like Mike was talking about, get you sidetracked, or get you complacent. It's that in between the time you're reborn and the time you inherit. And it's that time we've got to be up on guard. We've got to be careful to make sure that we keep glowing, keep sparking, keep our faith alive. <coughs> and so going into this land being a stranger. But it's his patience of faith and that's the challenge for us too. Remain faithful, keep our faith strong, keep joyful, keep full of anticipation in the long period between the glorious moment of our salvation. Uh, that, that was Caroline, by the way, in a nutshell. Speaking of Nick's nutshell, I guess, but if you were there, you watched it. Abraham didn't give up his hope. He continued in hope. He continued in faith. He never grew impatient. He never tried to grab a little of the world's goodies like his nephew Lot wanted to... to turned his tent towards uh, a place that was a big city and had all kinds of action and all kinds of stuff happening, right? Lot turned his tent towards Sodom. But Abraham just remained as a nomad. He's going to inherit the land someday. He's going to keep hanging in there. His sights were set on that heavenly city. And here's the reason why, I think, or at least one reason why. Ezekiel 48, 35 hints at it. He says, the name of that city will be, the Lord is there. The Lord is there. And so Abraham, being a pagan, comes out of that and focuses on one true living God. And he wants to go where the Lord is. The 
the Lord is there. And so what do we learn about the life of faith? It, be, it begins with a pilgrimage and a separation, not knowing where God is leading you, where he's going to take you, but knowing that he's promised you a future. The pilgrimage of faith is, is then going to call for the patience of faith, and then finally, uh, the power of faith. So you look at the life of Abraham, you see the power of faith. Uh, verses 11 and 12 of Hebrews 11 says, By faith even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and as good as dead, and he as good as dead, excuse me, came descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky and countless as the sand on the seashore. I'm sure you remember God's conversation with Abraham uh, regarding his covenant. But if you go back to and read Genesis 12, that was your assignment right at the beginning. So read Genesis 12, the first several verses, like 15 verses or so. But in the first three verses, talks about this covenant. I will, I will give you descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. And he's 75 years old and doesn't have any children. So if you can imagine that, getting that wonderful promise of having children at 75. Can you imagine? Stacy showed up with four kids last night at the baseball game. I, I turned over to her and Jason and said, you guys need four kids. And she, she gave me the snarliest look. I don't know. Um, and she's not even close to 75. <laughs> Getting there, but not close. <laughs> and so this promise came to him, and he doesn't possess it yet, but his descendants are going to get it. And so he's waiting for a place. He's waiting for a people. And now the problem that was that he and his wife are really old. They've never had any children. But here we see the wonderful power of faith. Faith is sometimes sees the invisible. Faith sometimes sees the impossible, and that's the power of faith. It trusts God to do what humanly cannot be done. And when there is that kind of faith present, God acts on that faith. Well, here's another thought question for you. And I'm not sure if I have an answer, so I'm, I'm depending on you all. Why do you suppose the writer of Hebrews said that Sarah believed the promise? That's verse 11. But the account in Genesis suggests that she laughed about getting pregnant in her old age, which has always suggested to me that she didn't believe and trust that God could do this. Or was she laughing because it was hysterically funny that an 80 year old was going to be nursing a newborn. Just the picture in her mind would be funny. But why do you suppose those seem to be opposing each other? How strong was Abraham's faith? This evening, I challenge you to also read Romans chapter 4, 1 through 18, and you're going to see his faith in action. It ends with a beautiful phrase, against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations. Something that seems so humanly impossible is possible with God. And it was credited to him, to Abraham, for righteousness' sake. For us, it's not much the miracle power as it is the power to be used by God in the conversion experience, the, the ministry experience, the life-changing experience, to use the gifts that the Spirit helps us with, to use the power of the Spirit and the fellowship of the body, and all those one another's that talked about, I think there's 22 or 23 one another's, you know, serve one another, be humble before one another, those kinds of things. Faith is the ignition switch that turns on spiritual power and makes us useful to him. I'd always uh, thought that David was a friend of God, which King David was a friend of God. 
But did you know that 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7 also says, with talking to God, he says, your friend Abraham did these things. What kind of faith do you possess? What kind of faith are you living with? And do you walk with each day? Are you willing to take a, a trip from Ur of the Chaldeans to Canaan to an inheritance that God has, has promised you and that will give you? Something to think about. Happy birthday, Lucy. Let's dance.